in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. So now we prepare to undertake what I consider one of the most important, and because of that, a little bit intimidating subjects that we have, a subject of the greatest importance, because what we're about to speak about is the Blessed Eucharist, and that which is the source and the center and the summit of our Christian faith is obviously all important. And so, the Holy Eucharist. Well, the Holy Eucharist, we know, completes Christian initiation. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism and configured more deeply to Christ through confirmation participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. At the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. This he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again, and so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the Church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed. The mind is filled with grace and a pledge of future glory is given to us. In those beautiful words, the Catechism of the Catholic Church begins to speak to us. I hope to speak to our hearts as well as our minds about this preeminent sacrament, the sacrament of all sacraments, a sacrament which is not only a sacrament, but which is the Lord himself, the source of all grace, the source of all goodness. As I have said now several times, the Church teaches that the Blessed Eucharist is the source and the summit of our Christian faith. It's also the center of that Christian faith. The Second Vatican Council taught very clearly on this. Vatican II taught clearly that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Church's life. The other sacraments, and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolate, are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it. For in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ himself. You can't say any more than that. In the Eucharist is contained the entire good the entire spiritual good of the Church, namely, Christ himself, our, Pasch, our Paschal sacrifice, the one who dying destroyed our death and rising restored our life. The Eucharist is the efficacious sign and sublime cause of that communion in the divine life and that unity of the people of God by which the Church is kept in being. It is the culmination both of God's actions sanctifying the world in Christ and of the worship men offer to Christ and through him to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are united to the heavenly liturgy in a most special way in the Eucharist. The Eucharist really 
is the sum and summary of our faith. Now, having said all of that, I think you get the point that of all things in the church, of all that we believe, of all that we pray, of all that we exercise in liturgy, we want to get this one right. Learn the teaching of the church in everything, but in a special way in the Eucharist. Because what could be more important than that which is the source of our faith, the center of our faith, and the summit of our faith? You want to get the teaching on the Eucharist right. Let's get this one right, and then God will help to make everything fall into place. What's the sacrament called? Well, Eucharist. It's an action of thanksgiving. That's what the very word means, coming from another Greek word, Eucharistine and Eulogine. That recalls the Jewish blessings that proclaim, especially during a meal, God's works of creation, redemption, and sanctification. So basically, the word Eucharist, just so you know, it's good to know the etymological derivation of words, what the word itself means, Eucharist, to give thanksgiving. It's also called the Lord's Supper, this sacrament, called the Lord's Supper because of its connection with that supper which the Lord took with his disciples on what we now call Holy Thursday, called the breaking of bread because Jesus used this rite as part of a Jewish meal, the Passover meal. We call it the synaxis, the Eucharistic assembly, because the Eucharist is celebrated amid, normally amidst the assembly of the faithful, the visible expression of the church, called the memorial of the Lord's passion and resurrection, because that's what it is, called the holy sacrifice, because it makes present the one sacrifice of Christ the Savior and includes the church's offering. It's called the holy sacrifice of the mass, sacrifice of praise, spiritual sacrifice, and pure and holy sacrifice because it completes and surpasses all of the sacrifices of the old covenant. So the church teaches and has always taught and always will teach that this sacrament, the Eucharist, is the sacrifice of Calvary the same sacrifice that Jesus offered on Mount Calvary to the Father in expiation for the sins of the world. That's what this sacrifice is. It's not another sacrifice. It's the same sacrifice which we enter into and make present. And I might add, if when we go to Mass, we are entering into the sacrifice of Calvary, then how should we be disposed? with what thanksgiving, with what reverence we should approach this sacrament of sacraments, the Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We call it the holy and divine liturgy because the Church's whole liturgy finds its center and most intense expression in the celebration of this sacrament. In the same sense, we also call it celebration the sacred mysteries. We speak of the most blessed sacrament because it is indeed the sacrament of sacraments. The Eucharistic species reserved in the tabernacle are designated by this same name. We call it Holy Communion because by this sacrament we unite ourselves with Christ who makes us sharers in his own body and blood. He draws us together and makes us one body in him through the power of his Holy Spirit. It's also called holy things, the bread of angels, bread from heaven, medicine for immortality and viaticum. Called the holy mass from the Latin word misa. At the end of, of the Latin mass, you remember the words, ite misaes. Well, misio is ascending. So after we have partaken of the Eucharist, after we've given glory to God, adored him, thanked him, after we've entered into the sacrifice of Calvary and made it present, after we, everything that we are and everything that we do, past, present, and forever, after we unite that with Jesus in the Paschal mystery and offer it 
through with it in him to the Heavenly Father. Then we're sent. Missio. That's what the Mass is. Ascending. You've been prepared, and now you're sent, filled with grace, to proclaim to all creatures that Jesus is Lord, to proclaim the good news of salvation. So we have all those different words and names that refer to this sacrament of the Eucharist. The Eucharist in the economy of salvation, it's very important to know where the Eucharist fits into in this work of salvation. We begin with the bread and wine. That's called the matter of the sacrament. Every sacrament has matter and form. There's uh, like water in baptism, the anointing with oil and confirmation in the Eucharist. We have matter, bread and wine. In the Latin rite, we use unleavened bread. In some of the Eastern rites, they use leavened bread. But we use in the Latin rite, unleavened bread. Now, what is it? It's wheat flour. Wheat flour and water, period. That's it. Don't mess with it. There is a parish. Now, it's okay when parishes make their own altar breads. That's okay. That's kind of a, a good thing to do. Uh, you participate in making the bread which is offered in, in Holy Mass. Not a bad thing, but you want to do it right. Don't mess around. There is a parish which, for obvious reason, not in this diocese, way far away, 3,000 miles far away. <laughs> not here. But far, far away on the East Coast, someplace, there is a parish that for many years was making its own altar bread, and last year someone gave me the recipe. It had in it eggs, milk, vanilla, sugar, on and on and on. It sounded like something right out of Betty Crocker. <laughs> now that seems funny, but let me tell you it wasn't because for years those people didn't have the Eucharist. No valid matter, no sacrament. And there's no the church supplies when it comes to form and matter in the sacraments. No ecclesia suplex when it comes to form and matter in the sacraments. You don't have valid matter, you don't have a valid sacrament. And so what did they receive? Bread. And that's one heck of a thing to do to the people of God. Don't mess with the essential matter of a sacrament. Wheat, flour, and water. And if there is a significant addition of other elements, it can render the matter invalid. You don't put eggs in the batter for the Eucharistic bread. You don't put sugar, vanilla, or anything else. You might have a nice tasting bread, but you don't have Jesus. And I don't care how good it tastes. It doesn't taste good to me, unless it's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so it's wheat flour and water. And the wine is natural wine from grapes. Canon law stipulates that it should be between 12 and 18 percent alcohol content. Now, if it's wine from grapes, thereabouts with the, you know, the alcohol content, that's valid matter. And then we'll talk about the valid form later. These signs of bread and wine have significance. They speak of the goodness of creation because they're natural elements. You know, bread and wine, those are natural things. They come from the earth. And so we offer God the goodness of creation in, in the gifts that we bring to the altar. We remember the old covenant offering of the first fruits. We remember the unleavened bread of the Passover. We remember that Israel lives not by bread alone, as Scripture tells us. We remember the cup of blessing which comes at the end of the Jewish Passover meal. We remember the multiplication of the loaves that Jesus performed more than once. We recall the water turned into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. So all these remembrances in, uh, in Scripture that refer to bread and wine, they find their completion, their fulfillment in the Blessed Eucharist. Number 1336, 
makes a very important statement. The first announcement of the Eucharist divided the disciple, just as the announcement of the Passion scandalized them. This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? The Eucharist and the cross are stumbling blocks. It is the same mystery, and it never ceases to be an occasion of division. Will you also go away? The Lord's question echoes through the ages as a loving invitation to discover that only he has the words of eternal life and that to receive in faith the gift of the Eucharist is to receive the Lord himself. From the beginning, it has been a cause of division. Jesus said, you think I have come to bring peace? I, have te I tell you, I have not come to bring peace, but to bring division. Where husband against wife, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. And we say, how can that be? Jesus is the prince of peace. How could he say, I've come to bring division? Why? Because the truth in the beginning will divide. The truth is a sword, and it will cut right to the marrow of the bone, and some will accept it, and some will not. And this is a hard saying. Who can believe it? You're telling us you're going to give us your own flesh and blood to eat? And they went away, many of them. That's the way it was in the beginning. And that's the way it is now. And that's the way I, sad to say, may, may always be until he comes again in glory. But one thing is certain. The truth in the beginning divides, but in the end it unites. You enter deeply into the truth, you enter into unity. For God is the truth, and God is one. And so if you want to unite the church, enter more deeply into the truth, which the church believes and teaches. And you will become a force for unity. Actually, there will be no ecumenism until we enter intimately and deeply into the truth which we believe and begin to live it with great fervor. And then we'll attract people to the Catholic Church. But yes, many find it hard to believe. It looks like bread. It tastes like bread. I'm supposed to believe this is Jesus himself, God? Only if you want to believe what he taught. That's what it is. But I can't understand it. Of course you can't. Neither can the angels. The greatest minds in the history of the church couldn't understand it completely. But they believed it. They believed it. And we believe. We walk by faith, not by sight. So that first announcement of the Eucharist, yes, it divided the disciples. Some went away. Today, it continues to divide. Some go away, they say, I don't buy it. I've heard people who should know better teach in places where it shouldn't be taught that Jesus isn't really there in the Eucharist. Jesus called the devil a liar and the father of lies. And the only one who wants you to believe that Jesus isn't really, truly, and substantially present in the Eucharist is Satan. For he knows that the power is in the Eucharist. The power for conversion, the power for goodness, the power to do God's holy will is in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the greatest gift a loving God ever gave to his beloved children. It's only the enemy of souls who wants you to believe that he's not really there. It's only a sign. How could you believe that? Are you gullible? I believe it because the Holy Spirit has given me light to see into the darkness. I may not understand it perfectly. Who could? It's a mystery. But I believe it. And that's what we're called to do. The Lord having loved those who were his own, loved them to the end, knowing that the hour had come to leave this world and, world and return to the Father, 
In the course of a meal, he washed their feet and he gave them the commandment of love in order to leave them a pledge of this love, in order never to depart from his own and to make them sharers in his Passover, he instituted the Eucharist as the memorial of his death and resurrection. And he commanded his apostles to celebrate it until his return. Thereby, he constituted them priests of the New Testament. Jesus chose the time of the Passover to celebrate the Last Supper, the first Eucharist, the first Mass. He fulfilled the Passover. Earlier, I spoke about the mystery of the Passover, the Paschal mystery, how the people of God held in captivity in Egypt at the command of Moses, who got it from God, sacrificed that Paschal lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their house and how their houses were protected from the destroying angel. And then came Jesus, the Lamb of God, into time and space. And like a great warrior, he was slain. And in his death, he destroyed death. And in his rising, he restored life. And when we are covered with that blood of the lamb, the destroying angel, passes over us, we're preserved in eternal life, is ours. And so the Lord instituted the Blessed Eucharist, and he did it at the time of the Passover Supper. Do this in memory of me. There is a memorial. I spoke about that word anamnesis. There is a memorial of the Lord's passion and death at the celebration of the the Eucharist. The liturgical celebration of the Eucharist has certain essential parts. Now, certain parts of the Eucharist can change throughout the centuries, can change to fit the times and the culture and the language. That's all right. But essential things can't change. Now, there are two essential parts, main parts of the Eucharist. There's the liturgy of the Word, and there's the liturgy of the Eucharist. The liturgy of the word is the readings, how we have towards the beginning of Mass, we have on Sunday a first reading, responsorial psalm, second reading. Then we have the gospel, the liturgy of the word, then a homily after the gospel. That's the liturgy of the word. Then we have the liturgy of the Eucharist from the offertory on. The movement of that liturgical celebration has been consistent throughout the centuries. Those essential elements can't change. We have the gathering, maybe a hymn. We all gather together because Jesus said, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I would be in their midst. And so we gather. We may have a hymn. We, we have that penitential rite where we confess our sins. We say maybe the, um, well, the, the, um, one of the prayers penitential rite, we call it now. And then we move towards that liturgy of the word, homily. Then we have the offertory, the presentation of the gifts at the offertory, bread and wine and a collection for the needs of the poor and for the church. Then we move into the anaphora. That's the Eucharistic prayer, the prayer of thanksgiving and consecration. That's the heart of the Mass, the Eucharistic prayer. That's where we come really to the center of the Eucharist. In the preface, which is the beginning of this anaphora or Eucharistic prayer, the church gives thanks to the Father through Jesus in the power of the Spirit for all his works of creation, redemption, and sanctification. Then we have the epiclesis. We talked about that. That's the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts. We have the institution narrative, and that's where the power of the words and the action of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit makes sacramentally present the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The anamnesis or the remembrance which follows recalls to mind the Paschal mystery. We have the intercessions where we pray for the Pope and the bishops, the priests, and all the faithful. And so you see, there's a movement of the liturgy of the Eucharist. 
The essential elements of that don't change throughout time. But certain incidental elements, the language, which way the priest faces, and so forth, certain things can change throughout history to meet changing times. But the essential things, they can never change. Now, we move into the essential, really core matter of the Eucharist, the sacramental sacrifice, which is Thanksgiving memorial and presence. It's thanksgiving and praise to the Father. Remember, we said that's what the word means. Eucharist means to give thanks. And so the Eucharist, in its celebration liturgically, is thanksgiving and praise to the Father. We thank him and praise him for all his gifts of creation and especially for the gift of his only Son and for the gift of the Holy Spirit who synthesizes and makes present all gifts. All gifts are contained in the gift who is the Holy Spirit. Then we have the sacrificial memorial of Christ and his body. And then the presence of Christ, the real presence, by the power of the Holy Spirit and through his word. First, thanksgiving and praise to the Father. Well, we have to give praise to our Father. We have to be thankful. God is a provident and loving Father. I want you right now, I'm going to do something like I do at missions and things like that and retreats. Do you have a real relationship with your Heavenly Father? Good. You bet. That's the way. I want you to have a deep personal relationship with your Father. We talk about a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and indeed, we should have that. But we need to have a personal relationship with God the Father, too. And sometimes, for many of us in this day and age, it's hard because you know many people grow up without a father today. There are a great many people who have not known the love of a father, and it's hard for many of our people today to relate to a father. They've never had one, really, and they don't really know what it means, and so we have to help them. God, our Father, is a father indeed. He is the principle without principle. He is the one who gives us life, sustains life. He loves us with a love that is beyond our wildest dreams. And we have to enter into relationship with him, our Heavenly Father. The Eucharist is indeed the memorial of Christ's Passover. Now, it's not merely a recollection of those past events. It makes them present. There is a mystical reality here. At Holy Mass, not only do we recall those events, but we make them present. You are there on Calvary. You are present. You enter into the Paschal mystery. That's what the Mass is. We don't repeat the Paschal mystery. We don't repeat the sacrifice of Calvary. We enter into that transcendent event, and we make it present in time and in space, at whatever time in history and whatever place in the world it is celebrated. We enter into it and make it present. It is a sacrifice, a true sacrifice. Now, in some places in recent years, the element of sacrifice in the Eucharist has been downplayed. It's important. It's essential. You can't do away with the element of sacrifice and have the Eucharist. It is a sacrifice because it is the memorial of Christ's Passover, number 1365. The Eucharist is also a sacrifice. The sacrificial character of the Eucharist is manifested in the very words of institution. This is my body which is given, which is given for you, and this cup which is poured out for you. In the Eucharist, Christ gives us the very body which he gave up for us on the cross, the very blood which he shed for us. That's the sacrifice of the Mass, the sacrifice of Calvary, the sacrifice of the Mass, one only sacrifice, same thing, except at Mass we offer it in an unbloody manner. We offer it sacramentally. The Eucharist is thus a sacri sacrifice because it represents, makes present, the sacrifice of the cross, 
and because it is its memorial, and because it applies its fruits. Those are the three reasons why the Eucharist is a sacrifice. It makes present the sacrifice of the cross, it is the memorial of the sacrifice of the cross, and it applies the fruits of the sacrifice of the cross. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the Eucharist being one single sacrifice, the victim who's offered is Jesus. When we offer Mass, when we offer the sacrifice of the Mass or the Eucharistic sacrifice, who is offering? Christ is offering. There's only one priest. His name is Jesus Christ. Ordained priests are taken into the one only priesthood of Jesus. And so when the priest celebrates Mass, it's Christ who celebrates Mass. It's Christ who is working during that celebration of the sacrament. Christ is the high priest, but he's also the lamb of sacrifice, the perfect victim. And so what does the high priest offer? He offers himself. He offers himself to the Father in expiation for the sins of the world. And this is the difference between the old covenant sacrifices and between sa pagan sacrifices. The sacrifice of the new covenant is totally new, unique, different. In every other kind of priesthood, in every other kind of sacrificial offering, the sacrifice offered is a vicarious sacrifice. The old covenant priest offered a bullock, a lamb, a pigeon. The pagan priest, likewise, offered a bullock, a lamb, a pigeon, some other kind of a thing, sometimes even human sacrifice. But in the new covenant, the high priest, Jesus the Lord, offers himself, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And so in this offering, we are taken up. Remember that we are one with Jesus. Baptism made us one with him. Confirmation strengthened us in him. And through the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice, we are taken up in the high priesthood of Jesus and through, with, and in him, we offer our spiritual sacrifice our whole life. Everything that we are, everything that we do, past, present, and forever, is taken up in that sacrifice of the high priest and the Lamb of God. That's what happens at Mass. The, the sisters, when I was in grammar school, our religious sisters who taught me in school, used to teach us that we should make an offering of ourselves at Mass, that, that we should think of ourselves as being on the paten with Jesus or in the chalice. We should unite ourselves very intimately just through an act of the will. You can do it. And then through with and in Jesus, we're offered as a sacrifice pleasing to the Father in expiation for the sins of the world. We enter into the mystery and the mission of Jesus, who through his priestly offering set the captives free we participate in that priestly work of the Lord Jesus. The presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Well, we know that through the power of his word and the action of the Holy Spirit, Jesus becomes truly present in the Eucharist. Now, Jesus is really present in the church in many ways. Jesus is really present in his word in sacred scripture. Jesus is really present in the Bible. He's really present in the church's prayer, or wherever two or three are gathered, there he is. He said it himself. So he's really present in the prayer of the faithful. He is really present in the poor, the sick, and the imprisoned, because he said, if you do it for the least of my brethren, you do it for me. He's really there. He's really there in the sacraments of which he is the author. He is really there in the ministers of the sacra sacraments. He's really there in the sacrifice of the Mass. He's really there in all these ways. But as the Second Vatican Council teaches, he is present most especially and preeminently in the Eucharistic species. The Eucharist, when we say the real presence, doesn't mean that the other modes of presence aren't real. Jesus is really present in you and in me. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. 
wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other person, two persons have to be. That's a mystery, but that's a doctrine of the faith. And so, yes, Jesus is really present in many ways, but the Eucharist is not the same kind of presence as all these other modes of presence. It's a higher presence, a more powerful presence, because it is a substantial presence. God is present in virtue of his power in all these other ways. But he is present not only by his power, but by a substantial presence. Jesus is there, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Body, blood, and soul speaks of the humanity of Christ. Divinity, well, God. And so he's there, the whole Christ, the entire Christ. Jesus is there in a mode of presence which we say is the mode of presence par excellence the highest way of being present. The mode of Christ's presence, this is number 1374, the mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharistic species is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all sacraments tend. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the whole Christ is really, truly, and the key word is, substantially contained. This presence is called real, by which is not intended to exclude other types of presence, as if they could not be real too, but because it is presence in the fullest sense. That is to say, it is a substantial presence, presence by which Christ, God and man, makes himself wholly and entirely present. It is by the conversion of the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood that Christ becomes present in this sacrament. Transubstantiation is a very important word. It is a word that the church has used for many, many years. It is a word that is not outdated. No one yet has come up with a word good enough to replace it. But if they did, it couldn't have any other meaning than that the substance, the nature, the essence of bread and wine is transformed changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Any understanding less than that is insufficient, and it's not what we believe in the Catholic Church. We believe that through the words of Christ the High Priest, uttered by his ministerial priest, and the action of the Holy Spirit, when he says, take this, all of you, and eat it, this is my body. This is my blood. It becomes indeed the body, the blood, the soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, a real, a true, and a substantial presence. Christ is there, whole and entire. And you may say, but I can't see him. Of course not. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith, as Scripture says. And so we give the assent of faith. If we could see him, we wouldn't need faith. Some of us might think it'd be a good idea if once in a while the good Lord might peek out of the tabernacle. <laughs> now, other than scaring us half to death, it might be a good idea because it would kind of help us because admittedly it can be difficult at times. You know, faith can be tough sometimes. But we're called to exercise faith. When you exercise faith, like exercising anything else, you strengthen it. And God wants us to have strong faith. That's what we need. And so we indeed walk by faith, not by sight. St. John Chrysostom puts it very beautifully. It is not man that causes the things offered to become the body and blood of Christ, but he who was crucified for us, Christ himself, the priest in the role of Christ pronounces these words, 
but their power and grace are God's. This is my body, he says. This word transforms the things offered. And St. Ambrose says about this transubstantiation or conversion from bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, then Ambrose says, be convinced that this is not what nature has formed, not what nature has formed, but what the blessing has consecrated. The power of the blessing pre prevails over that of nature, because by the bless blessing, nature itself is changed. Could not Christ's word, which can make from nothing anything, or things that did not exist, could not Christ's word change existing things into what they were not before. It is no less a feat to give things their original nature than to change their nature. That's what I said before. The God who created everything out of nothing, is it so hard for him to make something out else out of something already existent? If he creates everything out of nothing, no preexistent matter, God wills it into being. If he can do that, then certainly it's no problem for God to create something out of something or transform one thing into another thing. So the God who created everything out of nothing can certainly, through the power of the Spirit, change bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. The only time and the only reason you'll have any problem with that is because you have a problem with your faith, because you're confusing faith with reason because you want to understand what is essentially mystery. You will never understand it. I've had people say to me, all right, Father, if you can explain that to me, then, you know, once I understand it, then I'll become Catholic or I'll believe you. You've got to give the assent of faith. Faith precedes understanding. Faith, if you give it that assent, that obedience of faith, that will open the doors and help you to understand better. But if you don't give the assent of faith, not only will you never understand, but of course you'll never have faith either. So you end up with nothing. And so we need to walk by faith. So, because Christ, our Redeemer, said that it truly was his body and blood that he was offering, it has always been the church's conviction and the Council of Trent likewise holds that there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly, fittingly and properly, properly called transubstantiation. And quite simply, the big word just means the substance of the bread and wine is changed, transformed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's what happens at Mass. That's what happens at the Eucharist. That's what we go to adore. That's why if you have the Eucharist, you don't lack anything. That's why I can put up with anything if I can only have him. If I can have Jesus in the Eucharist, I don't need anything else. Because if you have the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, what could you possibly lack? What could you possibly lack? And I tell you, this is very important. This is crucial because if we begin to go astray, if people begin to think that Jesus isn't really there, that he's not substantially and truly there, then we will drift away. If we begin to believe that we can't go to him in person when we come into the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. I, I'll tell you the truth. If Jesus isn't in the Catholic Church in that substantial mode of presence, after a while I might begin to think who needs the Catholic Church. And so when you water down the teaching and people begin to believe that he's not really there, let me tell you what happens in the end. They drift away. They go someplace else where the fellowship is better. They go someplace else where the preaching is better. They just go away. Because if you don't believe Jesus is there, really, truly, and substantially, I might go away too. But I'll tell you something, he is there. 
he is there. And if he's there, then we need to be there. And we need to defend this truth. We need to live this truth. Jesus, the Lord, is really, truly, and substantially made present through transubstantiation of the bread and wine into his real, true, and substantial presence. That's a tremendously consoling truth. There is a lot of darkness spread abroad today in the church. If anybody tries to tell you that he's there in a way other than substantially present, if it's only a sign, they say, or only a symbol, go away fast. Don't listen to that stuff. He is there. I hear horror stories. I had a seminarian, not from this diocese, from another place. <laughs> really. It, was, it, it wasn't from anywhere around here. Not in California, either. <laughs> Honestly. Far away. Very far. He told me that at one point, in a, in a class, it, w it wasn't in seminary, I think it was in high school. He was in a Catholic high school. And they had celebrated a mass to begin the school year. And they used French bread and Coca-Cola. This was back in the 70s. And in the religion class, later that day, the teacher said, isn't it wonderful that our liturgy has become relevant, that we can now have a much more relevant uh, celebration with things we understand and, and this boy raised his hand he said no I don't think it's very good in the first place he didn't realize that it wasn't valid in the first place right because you don't have valid matter and so he was worried I said the crumbs were everywhere and you know the janitor came in after class and he, he threw the, the French bread in the garbage and if we believe that's Jesus then how can that be good and at that point the teacher became furious, and he said, it's time we stopped worshiping crumbs. Well, if you don't believe that transubstantiation takes place, then you think it's crumbs. But if you have the faith of the church, then you know very well that it's the body, blood, soul, and, G of, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And falling down, we worship him. We give the cult of adoration to the Eucharist. The Eucharist isn't cookie worship, as some other seminar seminarians had to endure that term in their own day. Some very good priests that I know today went through an age where they mocked it. One seminarian was thrown out, sent into exile, because he believed it's really Jesus. And he protested when they used that obscene term. Cookie worship? Cookie indeed. You'll find out someday that it's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so whenever you come in contact with that kind of blasphemous talk, that kind of blasphemous unbelief, go the other way. And don't be taken in by lies, for it's only the father of lies who seeks to put that across. And as one great priest And as one great priest of our own day once said, if you ever go to Mass somewhere and the priest comes out dressed in the clown suit, know very well who laid out the vestments in the sacristy. It was Satan. And if you ever go into a parish where they've taken Jesus down off the crucifix and put up a woman, a woman, a female body, a female corpus on the crucifix, as someone told me today, they've recently encountered, and they are worshiping Christa, know that you have entered a house of pagan worship, and beware because it's going on, even as we speak. And so don't get this one wrong, people of God. Don't let somebody convince you to exchange the truth of God for a lie and begin worshiping the creature rather than the creator. 
for Jesus is really, truly, and substantially present in the Eucharist. And if we have him, we can do without anything else. And we'd better have him. We'd better go to him. Because I'm going to tell you something. The answer to all of our problems don't lie in a political solution. The answer to the evil of abortion doesn't lie in a political or social solution, although we must engage in political and social action, but it will never be healed that way. The violence, the hatred, the wars, all of it will never be healed until we come before the Lord and fall down in adoration of his Eucharistic presence. You want to get rid of abortion? I'll tell you how to do it. You institute perpetual adoration in a chapel across from every abortion clinic in the world, and you'll shut them down, and they'll run. And there's no other way. There's not a shortcut. The Lord has given us the way. He said, I am the way. And so we come to him, we come to his Eucharistic presence, we come in adoration, we come in thanksgiving, we come in impetration, we come to beg him for grace and for mercy. I tell you that his perpetual adoration is instituted throughout the land, evil will be diminished throughout the land. We have the remedy, we have the medicine, we have the weapon to fight the good fight, but we'd better start using it or we're at our own risk. A classmate of mine has established more than 80 chapels of perpetual adoration throughout this country. This is a powerful work. A laywoman that I know from Wichita, Kansas, has established over 30 chapels of perpetual adoration through her hard work. It's where the power is. This is the Diocese of Sacramento. El Santissimo Sacramento. The most blessed sacrament. And that means something. That means something. And of all the dioceses in the United States of America, of all the dioceses in the world, I should think that Sacramento would be among the first to increase perpetual adoration in its parishes. If you want to enter into a work that's powerful, enter into that one. You'll do a great work for the Lord. The Eucharist is an entrance into the Paschal Banquet. We know that one day we'll share in the Banquet of the Lamb in the heavenly Jerusalem. We know that today we begin, we enter into that through communion. We need to remember that Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. We need to remember that he said, you must abide in me so that I might abide in you as I abide in the Father and the Father abides in me. We have to receive Holy Communion because we receive Jesus in Holy Communion. But in order to receive Holy Communion, we have to have the right dispositions. First of all, we are to be conscious of no grave sin. Now this is no news to most of us, but you don't go to communion if you're conscious of mortal sin. You go to confession first. Now that seems obvious, but I tell you it needs to be said. It needs to be said today. In a day and age when supposedly 60% or more of Catholic women of childbearing age are taking the birth control pill, we need to be aware that many a sacrilegious communion is going on and it's an outrage. And you can't just slough it off and pretend that mortal sin doesn't exist. It exists. And what is the remedy? Confession. No matter how bad your sins are, no matter if your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter, whiter than snow, washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so we go to confession. We're sinners. We all sin. We go to confession. Then we go to communion. We approach the Holy of Holies 
only after having been purified. That means from mortal sin. We should have the other disposition, discerning the body of Christ, as St. Paul said. And so we approach it knowing what we approach. When we come up to Holy Communion, we don't come up as though we were about to get a potato chip. We don't come up there nonchalantly. We come up recollected, reverent. How reverent should we be to receive God? Pretty reverent, I'd say. We should approach him a heck of a lot more reverent and a heck of a lot more conscious than if we approached an earthly king or president. We need to think about these things. These things are important. And then having received our Lord in Holy Communion, we're given an increase of that union with Christ, which is the meaning of human life. It's spiritual food for our soul. It helps to separate us from sin. It protects us from mortal sin. It does away, it eradicates venial sin. It unites the mystical body of Christ. It brings about that unity that we hope for where one day there will be one shepherd and one flock. If our dispositions are right, my dear friends, the day will come when having been made one with Christ, we'll stand before the heavenly Father transformed into the one that we have received. Unlike any other food which we assimilate and it becomes part of us, this bread of angels, this food for the saints, it transforms us. Jesus assimilates us into himself. We're transformed from glory to glory and then one day, standing before the Father, he will see his only Son reflected in us. And you will hear those blessed words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. Truth, in its essence, is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the light go out. Darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. Concerning the Eucharist, there were two documents uh, presented to the church in 1980. I'm going to make reference to these two documents in this hour in teaching on the Eucharist. The first one was a letter from Pope John Paul II to all the bishops of the world. Dominice Cene is the name of it, on the mystery and worship of the Eucharist. This was followed by an instruction on the Eucharist concerning worship of the Eucharistic uh, mystery by the Sacred Congregation for the Sacraments and Divine Worship. This followed the Holy Father's letter, and it's an instructional teaching on the Eucharist. I'm going to use those two documents this morning to kind of round out the teaching give a more practical uh, presentation. We presented the theology last time. Uh, as I said, it's very important, and we'll kind of finish that teaching on the Eucharist this morning. Some of the points which the Holy Father made in Inestimabile, or, or rather in Dominice Cene, are as follows. I'm going to hit the high points from these documents. The first one concerns adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. In my own lifetime, in the last, say, 15 years or so, I have heard all kinds of strange things 
uh, in the name of, quote, Vatican II. One of the things I used to hear and still do is that Vatican II somehow did away with adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. That's total nonsense, absolute nonsense. The Second Vatican Council reiterated what the Church has always taught, that adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, Eucharistic worship outside of Mass, is highly commendable. It's to be done. The Church promotes it. The Church wants it. And so the Holy Father, promoting that unchanging teaching of the Church, had this to say. Adoration of Christ in this sacrament of love must also find expression in various forms of Eucharistic devotion. Personal prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, hours of adoration, periods of exposition, short, prolonged, and annual, the 40 hours devotion, for instance, Eucharistic benediction, Eucharistic processions, Eucharistic congresses. In other words, the Church teaches that we should adore the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, make a holy hour, have Eucharistic adoration, have perpetual adoration in parishes. This is what the Church wants. People that say otherwise are confused, and they don't understand what the Church truly wants. This is a matter of Church teaching we want adoration. We want people to go before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament in that powerful presence of Christ and to offer reparation for the sins of the world, to ask the Lord for what we need. Knock. Seek. It'll be open to you. You'll find. Just go to the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and ask him for what we need in the church, in our family, in our own personal life. So the church encourages very strongly Eucharistic adoration. Another point from this document concerns the Church and the Eucharist. The Holy Father reminds us that it is necessary that we come together as a family to celebrate the Eucharist. But coming together, the community aspect, the fellowship aspect, is not the only reason that we come together to celebrate the Eucharist. The Church is brought into being when in that fraternal union and communion we celebrate the sacrifice of the cross of Christ when we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, in Eucharistic communion we receive Christ. Christ himself and our union with him, which is a gift and a grace for each individual, brings it about that in him we are also associated in the unity of his body which is the church. The fellowship, the community, which comes about when we come together at the Eucharist, that's very good. We need that. We need that fellowship. We need that, that family kind of meeting. But that's not the only purpose. What has a primacy is the sacrifice of Calvary, which is made present at the Eucharist, which we enter into and make present in time and in space. That has the primacy. That's the main reason we come together. We come together to perpetuate that redemptive sacrifice of the Lord. By doing that, we first establish that, what we could say, vertical, that vertical relationship with God. We enter into Jesus. We enter into his life, we enter into his mission, which is redemption. We enter into the way he effected redemption, which is through the Paschal mystery, his passion, death, and resurrection. That's what we enter into at the Eucharist, at Holy Mass. When we enter into that and thus solidify our relationship with God, the vertical, God and us, that makes us one with God, and that capacitates us then for an authentic community relationship with our brothers and sisters. You can't give what you don't have. And what we need to have comes from God. We need grace to love our brothers and sisters as God loves us. And so first we enter into union with God, 
that enables us, capacitates us to love our neighbor as ourselves. So both dimensions are very important, the vertical and the horizontal. Now the Eucharist and charity, this is a point which the Holy Father wanted to make, that relationship between Eucharist and charity, since the Eucharist is the soul of Christian life, and remember what the soul is, it's the life-giving principle of the body. Well, the soul of the body of Christ is the Holy Spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit that brings about the Eucharist as a sacrament, as he does with all the sacraments. We receive love through the Eucharist, remembering that love, like truth, is not a something, but a somebody. Love is God, St. John teaches us in his gospel. God is love. Love is God. The Eucharist is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who is true God as well as true man. And so when we receive the Eucharist, when we enter into the Eucharist, we receive love. We receive the one, Jesus, who is love. And so having received love, we are capacitated then to give love, to extend love to our brothers and sisters. Eucharistic worship is precisely the expression of authentic love. And remember this, as Jesus said, no greater love hath a man but that he lay down his life for his friends. Authentic Christian love is self-donating love, self-sacrificing love, that love which gives everything for the sake of the beloved. Now you may say, well, how does that affect me practically and personally? Well, husbands and wives certainly know all about it. If you are in love, you find out very quickly that love is a lot more than a feeling or an emotion. Love is a lot more than infatuation or chemistry. Love is a decision. Love is an act of the will. Love desires the highest and best thing for the sake of the beloved. You've got to receive the one who is love in order to give authentic love, in order to sacrifice yourself for your wife, for your husband, for your children. Sacrificial love is authentic love. Tested love is authentic love, and you will be tested in your marriage, in your Christian life, in everything. And you want to pass the test. And so, how do you pass the test? What's the best way of ensuring that? By being filled with the one who is love. And then you have the capacity to give love. The Eucharist, more than anything, fills us with the one who is the Father's love. Love personified, Jesus the Lord. We know that Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. In other words, you get what you're ready to get. I've said that many times. When we receive the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, infinite grace is made available. But individual persons don't receive infinite grace. Why not? Because we're not infinitely open. Because we're creatures, we're finite. Hence, we don't have the capacity to receive anything infinite. But infinite grace is there. It's poised and ready. The grace made available through the Paschal Mystery. The amount of grace we receive subjectively is directly proportional to our disposition, our openness. We could say the degree of charity or love, self-sacrificing love that we've achieved at that moment in time. Now, this goes a long way towards explaining the mystery of how so many of us can go to Mass Sunday after Sunday, receive the Eucharist Sunday after Sunday for many years, and not advance in charity, not advance in holiness or perfection. Why? Because we have not advanced in openness, in receptivity, and hence we don't receive what we should be receiving. Oh, it's there. The grace is there. Now, how do we become more open, more receptive? That's a function of the spiritual life. 
That's a function of the life of prayer and penance, a life of virtue. You have to practice all of these things to perfect them. Practice makes perfect. If you want to become stronger in the natural order, you have to exercise, right? What Olympic athlete ever became that without a lot of blood, sweat, and tears before they ever ran for the gold medal? Well, the same in the spiritual life. If you want to have stronger patience, patience must be exercised. And, you know, God does that for us. Some of you are saying right now, yeah, and you're an instrument of it. <laughs> That's true. If you can put up with me for a whole year, you'll have a high place in heaven. No question about it. Once a woman told me, Father, pray for me. I don't have any faith. I have weak faith. So I said, my dear friend, I will pray for you. I will pray the Lord. Increase your faith. She came back to me later, and she said, you didn't pray for me. Everything's worse. I'm going to lose my, my faith. I said, but I, I did pray for you, and I know God answered the prayer. Well, how do you know that? I said, I know because this past week, everything went wrong. Isn't that right? She said, yes. Your whole life is collapsing. Yes. God answered the prayer. He's exercising your faith in order to strengthen it. And having strengthened it, then he'll increase it. Anything that's to increase must be exercised. Any virtue must be exercised. And so the exercise of virtue increases our capacity to receive the grace of God. It's a basic principle in the spiritual life. So always remember that. Every moment we're to be working at our perfection, our spiritual life, our sanctification. The Holy Spirit will exercise us to open us, to expand our heart, to receive more grace, more love, more of God's sanctifying power within us. The Eucharist and our neighbor. This is another point which John Paul II makes in, in his letter to the bishops on the Eucharist. If our Eucharistic worship is authentic, the Holy Father says, it must make us grow in awareness of the dignity of each human person. The awareness of that dignity becomes the deepest motive of our relationship with our neighbor. Now, this is an extremely important point. Why should you respect anyone? Why should you love your neighbor as yourself? Because you like the way they look? No. Because you like the way they talk? No. Because they tell you what you want to hear? No. Why? Because of the basic dignity of the human person. We are to respect, and even I should say reverence, every human being not because of what they do, but because of what they are, who they are, a human person. No matter what color they are, no matter what religion they are, no matter what anything they are, they are human beings. And that alone requires our reverence for their personhood. They're made in the image and likeness of God. There's not a single human being that ever existed or ever will who is not made in the image and likeness of God. And therein is the basis for our respect for people, all people, whether they agree with us or not, whether they like us or not, whether they persecute us or not, doesn't matter. They are persons. And because of that, they have a nobility and a dignity that requires our respect. The Eucharist should help us to deepen in our respect and reverence for human beings. We have to become particularly sensitive to all human suffering. A person who has been open to the Eucharist, entered into the celebration of the Eucharist, and then made present the effects of the Eucharist, that person will be a very sensitive person. That person will suffer with the suffering. That person will rejoice with those who rejoice in the good. 
That person has the heart and mind of Christ. That person loves the truth. That person loves the good. That person loves life, respects life. The Eucharist, if we are properly disposed, will lead us to practice the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Now, the corporal works of mercy traditionally are, are seven, and the spiritual works likewise are, are seven. I'm going to just review them briefly for you. If we are receiving the Eucharist and interiorizing the Eucharist as we should, we should experience an increase in our desire to practice the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. One, feed the hungry. Two, give drink to the thirsty. Those kind of go together. There is no shortage today of opportunities to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty. It is no small thing that millions of God's children on this planet right now are starving to death if we are practicing what we are preaching, then we are sensitive to their plight. And today we have little excuse. We cannot plead ignorance for those haunting images come right into our living room by way of television of those starving children in Africa and in Asia, and I could even say sometimes even in our own country. Is that your business? You better believe it your business and mine. We're Christians, Jesus said, and so far as you did it for the least of my brethren, you did it for me. And are we Christians? If Christ is starving in front of us and we don't care enough to take care of him, it's Jesus who's starving. It's Jesus who's thirsty in those little ones. We have to feed them. We have to give them to drink. We have to clothe the naked. There are many who don't have anything, many who don't have clothing or shelter. It's Christ who's going without. Shelter the homeless indeed. Every city I go to, and I go to many, I find homeless people. They wander about the streets. And we do a pretty good job often, not always, often, in looking the other way. We're, in a sense, we don't want to get too involved. That's for the government. Let the social work of the government take care of that. You know, let them provide soup kitchens. Or sometimes, of course, the churches do it. Now, there are many wonderful people who do provide for the homeless, many of us, many good Catholics, good Christians. Bishop Wiegand had a wonderful project in Salt Lake City in conjunction with the Mormons, a wonderful soup kitchen. They took care of many homeless people and hungry people. And I know many of you are involved with such work, things like loaves and fishes, and that's, that's wonderful and commendable. It's living the Eucharistic life. It's not only entering into the, the Eucharistic sacrifice and celebration, but then making it present. What does it mean to make it present, to make Jesus present? And so you become his arms, you feed the poor, you help to house them and clothe them. That's great work. That's noble work. That's a corporal work of mercy. We comfort the imprisoned. How often do we Christians think like the rest of the world? Oh, he's in jail, huh? He's in prison. No good. He deserves it. Let him rot. I've heard Catholics talk like that as much as I've heard the rest of the world talk like that. You can't do it. You can't do it and think you're making Christ present to the world. Jesus said, as often as you visited me in prison, hmm? as often as you visited one of them in prison, you visited me, excuse me. As often as you visited one of those people in prison, you visited me, Jesus said. There is a great I don't want to call it a trick, but a, a great principle on how to do these things. Always, always keep that biblical principle in mind, that it's Jesus that you're helping. 
that it's Jesus that you're visiting when you visit those in prison or in jail. It's Jesus you visit when you're visiting the sick, comforting those in sorrow. Always think that way, and you'll be able to do it. If you think, oh, this is some criminal, he did a horrible thing, you won't go. You won't do it. Or someone's dying from AIDS. You think of all these superficial, oh, I don't want to... I don't want to go around them. I don't want to touch them. I don't want to... No. It's Jesus. Insofar as you did it for the least of my brethren, you did it for me. And so we practice these corporal works of mercy as a part of our Eucharistic life. The spiritual works of mercy are every bit as important as the corporal, Number one, admonish sinners. Ooh, there's a hard one. Admonish sinners. Well, that's a touchy thing. That's hard to do. You see, you don't want to rush into that like, like a bull in a china cabinet. That, that's one where you can get in trouble and you won't do any good if you're not discerning and prudent in how you do it. But it says very clearly, number one, spiritual work of mercy, admonish sinners. Admonishing sinners doesn't mean telling them what they want to hear. Admonishing sinners doesn't mean confirming them in their sins and saying it's okay. God loves you. God does love you. I don't care how bad a sinner you are. God loves you. But does God love your sin? No, he does not. Does God want you to be eaten alive by that sin? No, he does not. Let's think clearly. If you put on the mind of Christ, you're in touch with reality, and the reality is this. Every one of God's children is beloved. Every one of God's children is noble and beautiful. Sin rots our being. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. If you were dying of cancer and I loved you, I wouldn't stop loving you because of your disease. If I had the heart of Christ, I'd love you even more. And perhaps I'd even desire to take your suffering to relieve you. But I don't have to love the cancer that's eating you alive. That's sin. I hate sin. Why? Because I know something about it from the other side. I know what it does to the human person. I know how it erodes our human dignity. I know how it rots the fabric of being. I don't like it at all. Make war on sin because you love the sinner. That's not being unpastoral. That's being pastoral. And those who say that when we attack sin, we have no compassion or confused. Never attack a person. Never attack a person, no matter how badly they are in sin. Love that person. Love them very much. That's the Eucharistic heart of Christ. But admonish the sinner. Warn the sinner of his sin. Plead with him to get away from it. Instruct the uninformed. Many people have told me, Oh, Father, it's nice what you're doing, but, you know, in a way, it's, it's not much. You know, those, you're preaching to the choir. All these people that come to listen to you, they're all good people. Amen, brother. They are. They're all good people. All, all you, you're, you're the pillars of the church. You're the, the strong ones in the church. You're the ones who are concerned about your faith. But you see, it's not really true to say that because in teaching and preaching to you, we're helping to form those who then go out to the world. You go out to your family, to your workplace, to the schools, to society, to your parish, and then you pass on what you've received through the Holy Spirit. And so, we will reach tens of thousands. Why? Because every one of you are going to reach a great number of others in the course of your lifetime. And so it's a very worthwhile thing to do. And so we instruct the uninformed. Many people 
are uninformed. It's not their fault. They've never had a chance very often to hear the fullness of truth proclaimed. We are to counsel the doubtful how many there are who are in doubt, how many there are. Well, we have to give them counsel. Many are doubting their salvation, even in despair. We have to counsel them that God loves them, and God's name is mercy, and that he's holding out his hand to embrace them. We have to counsel the doubtful. We have to comfort the sorrowful, how many there are who are sorrowful. Many today are very much sorrowing. We have to comfort them. Jesus had great compassion for those who were sorrowing. If you have entered into the Eucharist, if you have received the Eucharist, you are to make present Christ, who is the Eucharist. This translates into action with our neighbor. It translates into charity. You have to care for people. It's not just for you. You know, my priesthood is not just for me. It's for the church. It's for you. That's why I'm here. Your Christianity, your knowledge of the faith is not just for you. It's good that it's for you, but not only for you. It's for many others. You are to share it. Be patient with those in error. Another spiritual work of mercy, sometimes difficult. To be patient. Do you find it difficult to be patient with those in error? Then sure enough, God's going to send you somebody who is in great error to sit right next to you and to goad you and poke you and work on you and try your patience. Might be in your family, might be in your workplace, might be at school, might be in your parish, might be who knows where. If you are having trouble with being patient with those in error, God will exercise your patience by sending you someone to be patient with. Be sure of that. Forgive offenses. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You want God's forgiveness? We all need it. Then you must be forgiving. You must have a state of mind, a perpetual state of mind, that you are going to forgive offenses, for surely you will be offended, you know, most daily. People are going to offend you in one way or another, and so you might as well put on the mind of Christ, allow the Eucharist to transform you into who you are, the body of Christ, and be forgiving, and you know you have peace. If you are quick to forgive, if you just let it roll off, you'll have peace, but those who can't instantly forgive, Oh, they're in turmoil. No peace. Always angry and bitter and cynical. You have to let it roll off. Pray for the living and the dead. That's a great spiritual work of mercy, and we are to do it. So there, those are the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which the Eucharist should increase within us. Like natural food, we know that the Eucharist is the bread of life, and the cup of eternal salvation. When we receive the Eucharist, we receive food. We receive food unto eternal life. This nourishment, this bread of angels, which is a supernatural kind of food. It's a little different than regular food. You know, when we eat something, we assimilate it, and it becomes part of us. With the Eucharist, because the Eucharist is this living bread come down from heaven. When we consume the Eucharist, Jesus assimilates us to himself. We truly become one with him, the body of Christ. And so we are filled with the life of Christ. So it's food. The Eucharist indeed is food, and it gives us life. Most of us, are pretty careful about eating regularly and eating good food. Sometimes when people give me that argument, oh, Father, I, I'm a good person. You know, I, I don't commit murder. I don't commit adultery. I'm good, but, you know, I don't like going to church. I don't find it relevant, and, I, you know, it, it's, that's okay, isn't it? Nope. 
Not okay. Why not? Quite simply because we as human persons are not called to a mere natural end. Hence, mere natural goodness is not sufficient. We are called to a supernatural end, union with the Trinity. And the only way you can enter into union with the Trinity is conformity to Christ, the only Son. And so by becoming one with Jesus, through him, with him, in him, you're enabled to enter into the life of the Trinity. Because of that supernatural end of human existence, we need supernatural means to acquire that supernatural end. The Eucharist is the preeminent means of acquiring that supernatural life in Christ. Now let's face it. We are concerned about our physical life. We don't want to become sick and die. I am sure that everyone in this room at le eats at least one good meal a week. When I was home a couple of weeks ago, one of my mother's friends patted me and said, Ah, Father, there'll be a lot of relics when you pass on. <laughs> they noticed that I'd gained some weight. We're usually pretty careful about eating enough to sustain life, and sometimes then some. Well, in the spiritual life, don't you think we ought to have at least one good meal a week? Well, that's the Sunday Eucharist. Those are of us who can try to be nourished daily, if it's possible. It's not always possible. People work. They can't get to Mass. I understand that. But at least one good meal a week, the Eucharist, bread of angels, supernatural food, we need it. Why? Why does the Church require us to go to Mass on Sunday? and holy days of obligation for the simple reason that I, the church is a good mother. What good mother wouldn't want her children to eat well? Not junk food, nutritious food. It will help them to grow to maturity and be healthy. The church is a good mother. The church wants us to receive the Eucharist, to participate in the Eucharist every Sunday, not to restrict our freedom, but to set our freedom free. And so we should willingly go to receive this super substantial bread from heaven. Now the Eucharist is sacred. It is sacred. It's not sacred because of something we add to it. It has an intrinsic uh, sacred nature to it. it. It is so sacred because it is Christ. The action of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. As the Holy Father taught, the Eucharist is a sacred and holy action, holy and sacred, because in it are the continual presence and action of Christ, the Holy One of God, anointed with the Holy Spirit, consecrated by the Father to lay down his life of his own accord and to take it up again. That's why the Eucharist is a sacred action, it is instituted by Christ, and Christ himself acts through the ministerial priest at the Eucharistic celebration and sacrifice. As the Holy Father teaches, the priest offers the holy sacrifice in persona Christi. This means more than offering in the name of or in place of Christ. In persona means in specific sacramental identification with the eternal high priest, Jesus, who is the author and principal subject of this sacrifice of his, a sacrifice in which, in truth, nobody can take his place. Only he, only Christ, was able and is always able to be the true and effective expiation for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. Only his sacrifice and no one else's was able and is able to have a propitiatory power before God, the Trinity. And so the priest, the ministerial priest, can't take Christ's place. When the priest offers Mass, celebrates the Eucharist, it is Christ 
who is celebrating the Eucharist. It is Christ who is offering himself the sacrifice of Calvary through the instrumentality of the priest. There is only one priest. This afternoon, I am going to give the class on the sacrament of holy orders. I'm going to speak about the priesthood. But there's only one priest. Jesus is the high priest. All of us enter into the priesthood of Christ through baptism. And then out of the baptized, some men are called to the ministerial priesthood through the sacrament of holy orders. But there's only one Christ. He's the high priest offering, and he is the victim, the Lamb of God, who is offered to the Father in expiation for the sins of the world. The sacred rite of the Eucharist cannot be trifled with, the Holy Father teaches. If separated from its distinctive sacrificial and sacramental nature, the Eucharistic mystery simply ceases to be. It admits of no profane imitation, an imitation that would very easily and indeed regularly become a profanation. This must always be remembered, the Holy Father tells us. Perhaps above all in our time, when we see a tendency to do away with the distinction between the sacred and the profane, given this widespread tendency, at least in some places, to desacralize everything. In view of this fact, the Church has a special duty to safeguard and strengthen the sacredness of the Eucharist. In our pluralistic and often, often deliberately secularized society, the living faith of the Christian community, a faith always aware of its rights vis-a-vis -vis those who do not share that faith, ensures respect for that sacredness. I could speak a long time on this subject, but I don't have a long time. You get the point. The Eucharist is sacred, the most sacred, the most holy thing that takes place in the universe. It is the sacrifice of Calvary made present in time and space. We don't repeat the sacrifice. We enter into it and we make it present through the sacramental action of that beautiful sacrament of the Eucharist. That being the case, with what reverence should we assist at Holy Mass? With what reverence should we adore the Lord really, truly, and substantially present in the Blessed Eucharist. Last month, in that class on the Eucharist, for those of you who weren't here, I went into more detail on this question of the presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. Now, our Lord is present, really present, in many ways in the Church. We can speak of a real presence of the Lord in sacred scripture, He's surely present in his word. Jesus is really present in the ministers of the sacraments. Jesus is really present in you, every baptized person in a state of grace. But in the Eucharist, there is not only a real and true presence, but a substantial presence of the Lord. He is there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And because of that, it is the most dynamic presence imaginable. Jesus is present substantially only in heaven and in the Eucharist. It is the presence, the mode of presence par excellence, the highest presence, the most noble presence, a presence unlike any other presence. And so it is not to be just considered another form of presence. It is another form of presence, but higher. The most noble, the most powerful presence of God in time. Emmanuel, God among us. Real, true, and substantial. Because of that, we have reverence for the Eucharist. Because of that, the Eucharist is sacred, holy. As the Holy Father continues in his teaching, Above all else, 
the Eucharist is a sacrifice. We know it's the sacrifice of Calvary. I taught at some length last month about that. I'm not going to repeat the whole teaching. I don't have time. But the preeminent dimension of the Eucharist is that of sacrifice. It's not another sacrifice. We don't repeat the sacrifice. Jesus offered the sacrifice of himself on the cross once for all. We enter into it and make it present at the Eucharistic sacrifice. It is an unbloody sacrifice which makes present, which commemorates the bloody sacrifice of the cross. The Holy Father teaches that the bread and wine presented at the altar and accompanied by the devotion and the spiritual sacrifices of the participants are finally consecrated so to become truly, really, and substantially Christ's own body that is given up and his blood that is shed. Thus, by virtue of the consecration, the species of bread and wine represent in a sacramental, unbloody manner the bloody propitiatory sacrifice offered by Christ for all, once for all, on the cross to his Father for the salvation of the world. The two tables of the Lord, table of the word and the table of the bread. They're one. The Eucharist is one celebration, one sacrifice, which consists of those two integral parts, the table of the word and the table of the bread or the Eucharistic sacrifice. You can't separate them. The Holy Father points out that the language of the liturgy, although changed so that we now have access to the vernacular, which is a good thing, so that we can understand what's being celebrated, so we can enter into it and pray from the heart. I feel it's a blessing. I think it's a great thing. But the Holy Father points out the other side of it. He says that we have since the Council a richer and wider variety of readings, and they are in the vernacular. Because of that, everyone is able to participate with fuller understanding. That's a very good thing. However, the Holy Father goes on to say, nevertheless, there are also those people who, having been educated on the basis of the old liturgy in Latin, experience the lack of this one language, which in all the world was an expression of the unity of the church and through its dignified character elicited a profound sense of the Eucharistic mystery. It is therefore necessary to show not only understanding but also full respect towards those sentiments and desires. As far as possible, these sentiments and desires are to be accommodated as is moreover provided for in the new dispositions. The Roman church has special obligations towards Latin the splendid language of ancient Rome, and she must manifest them whenever the occasion presents itself. And so what the Holy Father is saying is that Latin wasn't outlawed. Don't believe that distortion of the truth. The vernacular was permitted as an exception. That's how it came about at Vatican II. It didn't outlaw Latin. Latin is still the official liturgical language of the Roman Rite, the Latin Rite, which most of us belong to. Now, so you have to have a balance. You have to have a balance. I feel that most of us profit from being able to celebrate Mass in English, our language, because we understand it, because we can uh, pray from the heart in that language. I can read Latin, but I, I can't think in Latin. I don't know it that well that I can think in the language or pray from the heart in the language. And so there is a certain something lacking because of that. So we're blessed to be able to celebrate Mass in the vernacular. However, we should not curse Latin. We should, not, we should have a certain respect for it. After all, for many, many centuries, it was the language of the Roman Rite. Some of the, the language should be preserved. Uh, a very beautiful mass can be had by 
uh, saying some of the parts of the Mass, the Agnus Dei, uh, the Sanctus in Latin. We know what those words mean because we're so familiar with the English, it's not a great impediment to us that we sing some of those beautiful parts in the Latin language. So the, the point the Holy Father's making is it's not an either or. We should rejoice because we have a greater access to the liturgy in our own language. That's good. But not to throw away Latin. There's something good and noble about it. So just have a balanced kind of. Truth in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the light go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word. The eternal word, Jesus the Christ. The two parts of the Mass, Table of the Word, Table of the Eucharist, they are so closely connected that they form but one single act of worship. Persons should not approach the table of the bread of the Lord without having first been to the table of his word. Now, that's a norm. Normally speaking, uh, we don't approach communion unless we have participated in the readings normally. Now, if you're sick, uh, that, that's different. But even the, uh, when bringing communion to the sick, we have a reading in, in the right for distributing communion to the sick. So they go together. The reading of the gospel passage is reserved to the ordained minister, namely the priest or deacon. No one else is to read the gospel. The priest or the deacon reads the gospel, and the homily is given by the priest or the deacon. That's it. Now, no one, no one, no pastor, not even a bishop, has the right to preempt or suppress that. That's a norm of the universal church. Now, if there is a person visiting, a missionary who's not a priest or deacon, they can give a talk after communion. Perfectly okay to deliver a talk after communion at Mass. But the homily and, and coming after the gospel is only to be done by the ordained minister, a priest or deacon. That's a norm. That's still in effect. It is reserved to the priest by virtue of his ordination to proclaim the Eucharistic prayer. It is an abuse to have some parts of it read by the deacon or anyone else. Okay? The people have their own respective parts to respond. It's a dialogue mass. We, we, the priest has his part, the congregation has its part, and it goes that way. And we have to stay in our own sphere. God is a God of order, not chaos. Only the Eucharistic prayers included in the Roman Missal or those that the Apostolic See has by law admitted are to be used to modify the Eucharistic prayers approved by the Church or to adopt others privately composed is a most serious abuse the Church teaches. You don't mess with the Eucharistic prayer. The matter of the Eucharist is bread and wine. In the Roman Rite, which most of us belong to, the Latin Rite, the Western Church, plain wheat, flour, and water. That's the valid and licit matter. Now, if somehow you were to use leavened bread, it would be illicit but valid. It would be illegal but valid if you had some um, leaven in there, some yeast. However, if you begin to add other ingredients, as I said last month, vanilla, eggs, milk, whatever, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's most serious, you invalidate. You can very well invalidate the matter. The church defines what the bread is. 
not somebody's whim and fancy. The church defines it, and that's the tradition from the beginning. Plain wheat, flour, and water, and wine, the fruit of the vine, grape, wine. That's the valid and licit matter for the celebration of the Eucharist. The church has allowed for extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist, and well, we should, because we need extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist, and they perform a very great service to the church, because there are some who would never be able to receive the Eucharist without the help of extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist. Nursing homes, hospitals, at Mass, when you have a big Sunday Mass, there's only one priest, and it would unduly prolong the length of the service. It is a very good thing, but it is an exception. The ordinary minister of the Eucharist is the priest or deacon. At Mass, if you have so many people that you would add an hour or a half hour or more, in our culture anyway, um, then you can, under the current discipline, you can justify the use of extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist. However, it's an exception to the norm and it's not to be abused. Accordingly, the document says, accordingly, a reprehensible attitude is shown by those priests who, who, though present at the celebration, refrain from distributing communion and leave the task to the laity. You just can't do it. It's not a pastoral thing to do. The Church reminds us that even after communion, the Lord remains present in the sacred species. Accordingly, when communion has been distributed, the sacred particles remaining are to be consumed or taken by the competent minister to the place where the Eucharist is reserved. Now, here we come to a very important thing. This has been a, something that ca has caused me personally a great deal of suffering in my life. And I want to really make it clear. Once the bread and wine have been consecrated into the body and blood of Christ, that is Jesus. And it doesn't cease to be Jesus. Catholic theology teaches us that any particle, the smallest particle, if you can see it, if it's sense perceptible, one drop of the precious blood, Jesus is there. The whole Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity, it doesn't cease to be the presence of the Lord. And so it is to be treated with the pres as the presence of the Lord. It is to be consumed. Or if we have several hosts left over, we take them back to the tabernacle, and they are reserved there. The particles that break off from the consecrated host, that's the Lord. The precious blood, if there are only a couple of drops, it's the Lord. The purification of the vessels is necessary to treat with reverence the real, true, and substantial presence of Christ. And we priests aren't to play fast and loose with the Lord. Those particles have to be consumed. Those few drops of the precious blood, those Vessels have to be washed, purified. You consume the water. What happens, you, you know, you shouldn't have a lot of the precious blood left over. You should be careful to consecrate pretty much what's going to be consumed, but you can't tell sometimes. Large gatherings, you have several ounces. What do you do with it? You consume it. Do you pour it down the sacrarium? No, you do not. That's not what it's for. You consume the precious blood. But what if I have a thousand gallons of it, Father? <laughs> what if it's impossible? All right. Then you would dilute it so that it is no longer the precious blood, so that it is mostly water rather than the precious blood, and then you would dispose of it down the sacrarium. But that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. It's to be treated as for what it is, the precious blood of the Lord. And there is quite a bit of abuse of this far and wide. The particles that are in the ciborium, the patent, that's not bread. 
It doesn't cease to be Christ and become bread again, never. It's Christ. So long as it's sense perceptible, that's the teaching of the church, it is to be, the vessels are to be purified. And we're to have, be, be, take great care with this, not to become scrupulous, but to be careful and reverent. The faithful are recommended to make a thanksgiving after Mass. We should remain in prayer a bit. If we have time during Mass, uh, after communion, there should be a period of silence if possible. Or if there isn't that, then you can stay. But make a thanksgiving. The Eucharist means thanksgiving. We should thank God for this great gift that he has given us. Private, once again, public and private devotion to the Eucharist is highly recommended. The tabernacle in which the Eucharist is kept can be located on an altar or away from it in a spot in the church which is very prominent, the document says, which is very prominent, truly noble, and duly decorated. Or, or in a chapel suitable for private prayer and for adoration by the faithful. Uh, at St. Peter's in Rome, uh, the Eucharist is in its side chapel, but a very beautiful side chapel, and it's a good place for adoration. It's quiet. You can close the door because you know how it is at St. Peter's, so many people coming in and out. And so to give due reverence, they have done that. The venerable practice of genuflecting before the Blessed Sacrament, whether enclosed in the tabernacle or publicly exposed, should be preserved, genuflecting and it should be done in a reverent manner, not, not like we have a muscle spasm or something, but in a, in a reverent manner showing that we're making a statement of, of reverence to the Lord who's present. Same thing when you approach communion. The document says when we approach communion, you're to make a sign of reverence. Now, it says that kneeling is already a sign of reverence. When the faithful communicate kneeling, no other sign of reverence toward the Blessed Sacrament is required, since kneeling is itself a sign of adoration. When they receive communion standing, it is strongly recommended that coming up in procession, they should make a sign of reverence before receiving the sacrament. Now, this should be done at the right time and place so that the order of people going to and from communion is not disrupted. Now, there should be uniformity. If in the parish people receive communion standing, fine. Receive standing, but make a sign of reverence, a sign of the cross maybe, a bow. When the, first, when the person in front of you is receiving, then you make a bow or make the sign of the cross as a sign of reverence for the Lord you're about to receive. It doesn't take much effort. It says so right in the document. And I'm going to tell you, Bishop Wiegand, was one of the only bishops I know of who reminded the church of this at a meeting of the bishops. That sign of reverence should be made because the Lord is there. If we're not receiving kneeling, okay, we receive standing, fine. But make the sign of reverence then. Don't have people falling over you, sign of the cross, a bow, and then receive. You won't disrupt the flow of people coming to communion, and you will show the reverence. That's the mind of the church. Sad to say that many do not want that, and for whatever reason, I can't fathom that recommendation the bishop made, as far as I know, was totally ignored. But you don't have to ignore it. When you go to communion, you can make a small sign of reverence, not a big spectacle, just a little bow, little sign of the cross. You're saying something, I believe. That's what you're saying. I'm going to begin to speak about the sacrament of penance. The church teaches us that through the sacraments of initiation, Christian initiation, man receives the new life of Christ. But we are reminded we carry this life in earthen vessels. We remain, it remains hidden with Christ and God. We are still in our earthly tent. We're subject to suffering, to illness, 
and to death. This new life in Christ, which we receive at baptism, can be weakened, and it can even be lost through serious sin. The Lord Jesus Christ, as the physician of our bodies and souls, he forgave sins. He forgave the sins of the paralytic. He restored him even to bodily health. The Lord has willed that the church continue this work of reconciliation. The sacrament of penance and reconciliation is the sacrament that Christ has given to us in the church for the removal of the guilt of serious sin after baptism. Those who approach the sacrament of penance, the catechism teaches us, obtain pardon from God's mercy for the offense committed against him and are at the same time reconciled with the church which they have wounded by their sins and which by charity, by example, and by prayer labors for their conversion. Now note something that that number 1422 says that I just read, that the sacrament of penance grants us pardon. We receive pardon from God's mercy for the offense committed against him. I have heard it said now and then that God isn't offended by sin, that we just offend each other. That's false. God is offended by sin. If you want to know how much, you can look at a crucifix and meditate on it for the rest of your life, and you will find out what sin does to God. Jesus is God. He's a divine person, and he suffered through his human nature. And what inflicted that suffering upon him? Sin. Sin is what wounded, and I should say murdered, the one, the Word, who became flesh and dwelt among us. So sin is a terrible thing. But God so loved the world that he sent his only Son to heal us from the wounds and divisions of sin. And that sacrament of penance or reconciliation, confession, is a tremendous gift. It's the mercy of God. When I do parish missions, I try to impart that knowledge to people. Don't be afraid of confession, and don't be too proud to go to confession, and don't think it's beneath you. Christ, through his mercy, instituted that sacrament for us. It is mercy. Do not fail to avail yourself of God's mercy. The Holy Father goes at least once a week, and it's not because he has more sins than you or me. It's because he's spiritually astute, and he knows that he can use all the help he can get. So can I. And so we should love the sacrament of reconciliation and penance. It heals us from sin. It strengthens us against committing future sins. It heals the wounds that sin causes in our own being. And it reconciles us with the church, which we also offend and wound through sin. Now, what's this sacrament called? Well, it's called many things. It's called the sacrament of conversion. Conversion because it makes sacrament, sacramentally present Jesus' call to conversion, which is the first step in returning to the Father from whom we have strayed through sin. The sacrament of penance, since it consecrates the Christian sinner's personal and ecclesial steps of conversion, penance, and satisfaction. It's called the sacrament of confession because we confess or disclose our sins to Christ in the person of the priest. It's called the sacrament of forgiveness since the priest's sacramental absolution imparts the forgiveness of God. Only God, only God can forgive a sin. And then you might say, well, great, I can just confess my sins to God then. Nope, that's not what God said. Jesus instituted this sacrament. God forgives the sins, but he does it through the ministry of the priest in that sacrament of confession, penance, or reconciliation. 
It's also called reconciliation because it imparts to the sinner the love of God who reconciles us. Second Corinthians tells us, be reconciled to God. He who lives by God's merciful love is ready to respond to the Lord's call. Go first and be reconciled to your brother. Sin breaks our communion with our brothers and sisters. Even those sins which we think don't have a victim. Every sin has a victim. The victim is the one, of course, who commits the sin, first and foremost. Some people say prostitution is a victimless crime. What a lie. What a lie. The person who engages the prostitute hurts themselves through that sin. They're a victim. The prostitute is a victim. There are many victims. Society becomes a victim because it's led further and further down the road of immorality, darkness, and ultimately moral and spiritual death. Why a sacrament of reconciliation after baptism? For the simple reason that sin can take place after baptism. Yes, baptism removes original sin. If we're an adult, it also removes all personal sin and even the temporal punishment due to that sin. But it doesn't remove the consequences of sin, that tendency towards sin, concupiscence, or the fomes, we say in Latin, that tendency to sin. So that remains even after baptism. And so we can sin. We do sin. And so God's mercy provides for us a sacrament to reconcile us if we've sinned after baptism. We're called to constant conversion as baptized people. Sometimes you hear people say, well, my conversion took place on such and such a time. You know, I say that sometimes. My, my conversion took place at a certain time and in, in place. And that's all right to say that. That happens. But we have to remember that conversion is something that takes place daily. We're called to conversion daily. Conversion isn't something that happens once. You know, the same thing with being born again. Are you born again, brother? I hope so. I hope so. Well, well when did it happen? When did you give your life to Jesus? Well, I did, do, can say, I did it at a certain time. There, there's something to that. But is it over? No. It's not over as of that time. You know, 12, 13 years ago, 20 years, 30 years ago, we converted to the Lord. We became serious about living our baptism. Was that it? No. Was that the end of it? No, that's the beginning of it. Then what do you do? Then you live it out every day. We're called to daily conversion. Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. And so this constant call to conversion daily, dying to our own egocentric ways, coming alive in Christ, living his life, making his life present. We're called to interior works of penance. Interior penance is the most important kind, that conversion of heart which puts Christ at the center of our life, which inspires us and impels us to live his life, to accomplish his mission, which is redemption, and the way he accomplished the mission, which is through a cross of pain and suffering. And so Jesus said, the servant is no better than the master, and where I am there my servant will be. And so there he is, lifted up. Why? In order to draw all men to himself. And so we, like him, must be lifted up. We must do penance. We must have an interior sense of penance constantly dying to that selfish way of doing things that the spirit of the world manifests, being constantly reborn in Christ, putting him first. There's a kind of a rule for a Christian. It's the opposite of the world's rule. The world says, look out for number one, meaning you. Boy, that's the devil's rule. Our rule? Yeah, look out for number one. Who's he? That's God. He's number one. Look out for God. God first, everybody else second, me third. You know what happens then? The last become first. 
That's the Christian way. The last become first. Humble yourself in order that God might exalt you. Take the last place at the wedding feast so that the master of the feast will call you up closer. That's the way it is. God first. Everybody else second. Me last. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And so we try to do that as best we can. There are many forms of penance in the Christian life, fasting, almsgiving. There are three main biblical forms of penance. We have fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, and they all go together. If you want to pray with power, do penance. If you really want to pray with power while doing penance, then take care of your neighbor. That's almsgiving. Take care of the poor. Even if you are poor, I know some very poor people who are very pleasing to God because of their almsgiving. You remember the widow of Naim. She didn't have anything. She put a, like a copper penny in the collection basket. Well, she gave more than the rich people, our Lord said, because she gave out of her need. They gave out of their surplus. That's very pleasing to God. You know, I'm going to give you a very beautiful principle. If you have the guts to live it, God will bless you. You want to get rich? Give everything away. You want to be well off? Start being generous. Sacrificial giving, that's what it's called. We're afraid to do that. We operate by what's called human prudence rather than divine. We're afraid. You know, I, we did a survey in, in the parish at, at home. I didn't do it. They did it. My mother told me about it. Forty percent of the people in the parish, and, and it's not that poor a parish, still put one dollar in the collection basket on Sunday. Now, I am not demeaning the fact that somebody puts anything in there. That's good. And some of them, very few, uh, might have a hard time coming up with that dollar. It's true. And God bless them for what they do. But I happen to know that the mean income of that area is about thirty-five, forty thousand 40000 a year. And a lot of these people spend lots of money on cigarettes, on movies, on baseball games, on any number of things. But that same old crumpled dollar bill is what goes in there on Sunday morning. Now, God bless the people that put the dollar bill in there, but the whole point is God's blessed us. You know, we're, our income very often is increased 100, 200, 300 percent, but the same one dollar that was being put in there in the 40s is going in there today. There's got to be a correlation. You know, that widow gave us an example. You've got to give in order to receive. God blessed her greatly. You want to get rich, I'll tell you how. Give it all to Jesus. You'll be rich beyond your wildest dreams. Well, let's get right to the sacrament. We know that sin is before all else an offense against God, a rupture of the communion with him. And at the same time, it damages the communion of the church. For this reason, conversion entails both God's forgiveness and reconciliation with the church, which are expressed and accomplished liturgically by the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. So, I could even go one step further if I could extend the logic of this teaching. Sin results in brokenness. Sin disintegrates. The principle of life and being is integration. God is one perfectly one, perfect integration, perfect simplicity. Sin tends to disintegrate. All of the brokenness in the universe comes not from the brokenness out there, but from the brokenness in here. Disintegration in the world is the result of the interior disintegration in individual human persons. That is called sin. And so a triparate integration takes place through the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. First and foremost, the individual is reconciled with God. They're reconciled with the church and the whole universe, 
and they're reconciled with themselves, the brokenness within them, that disintegration inside healed. You know, you can't have a relationship with anybody else if you yourself are broken into a thousand pieces. You need to be healed before you're going to have a relationship which is integral and healthy with anybody else, husband and, and wives. You, you have to know that. If you are broken in, in a, a dismal mess yourself, don't think that by some kind of counseling or just extrinsic operation you're going to have a good relationship. You've got to be right with God. You've got to humble yourself. And when you're solid inside, then you can bring something to the relationship. The relationship will be solid. The family will be solid. The church will be solid. The world will be solid. Confession can do all that. We need to be reconciled with God, with each other, and with ourselves. Only God forgives sin. We've said that. He reconciles through the church, through the power of binding and loosing, God forgives our sins. Now, there are some who would try to say that confession isn't a sacrament, it's not biblical, but of course it's very biblical, and it is a sacrament instituted by Christ. You go back to the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. This passage is of enormous importance for several reasons. When they were going through the region of Caesarea Philippi, I have read this passage to you more than once, when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And he received those conflicting answers. Well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then Peter gave the right answer. You are the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, no mere man has revealed this to you, Peter, or Simon, and I for my part declare that you are rock. He changed his name. Jesus is the rock. There's only one rock. The rock is Christ. The rock is God. That's the rock upon which our faith is built. But that rock grafted Peter into himself, and he called him rock. And he said, I'll build my church upon you, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what else did he say? He said, I will entrust to you, Peter, church, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you declare bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you declare loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now that is traditionally held to be a proof text for the institution of the sacrament of reconciliation, penance, or confession. Christ instituted the sacrament a further scriptural proof. In the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, on the evening of that first day of the week, even though the disciples had locked the doors of the place where they were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood before them. Peace be with you, he said. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. At the sight of the Lord, the disciples rejoiced. Peace be with you, he said again. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive men's sins, they are forgiven them. If you hold them bound, they are held bound. Now that, the church, the only one competent to evaluate Scripture or divine revelation is the magisterium of the church, and the magisterium has held throughout the ages that that refers to the institution of the sacrament of penance or reconciliation. I've heard some so-called theologians say, well, everybody was there, so we can all forgive sins. If I forgive your sins, they're forgiven. No, that's not how the church has interpreted it. That's a personal interpretation which isn't in accord with objective truth. That's someone playing God, and that doesn't work. Who was it intended for? It was intended for the apostles and their successors. That ability to bind and loose is the hierarchy of the church. Those in the sacrament of holy orders, the first two degrees, the bishops and the priests, can give sacramental absolution. That's the teaching of the church. 
That's the teaching of Jesus Christ. If anyone has a problem with that, you don't have a problem with me. You don't have a problem with the Pope. You have a problem with Jesus. And that's the case with many of these teachings. We did not make them up as we go along. We received them as a sacred deposit from the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so, that sacrament, like any sacrament instituted by Christ, has two essential dimensions. We call it form and matter. Now, the form of the sacrament is the words. You know, like in baptism, the form of that sacrament is the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then with the pouring of the water, which is the matter, you have a valid sacrament. Well, the form and matter of the sacrament of penance. Well, there have been many changes in the discipline of that sacrament throughout the ages. But underneath all the change, which is incidental, there is a constant uh, part that doesn't change. There are three essential elements on the part of the penitent, and then there's the act of absolution on the part of the church through the priest. First of all, contrition. These are called the acts of the penitent. There are three. Contrition. Contrition is that heartfelt sorrow for sin. And it contains within itself a firm purpose of amendment. You are not sorry unless you intend not to commit that sin again as best you're able. Now, I know we're weak and we can fall again. All right. But at the time of the confession, I'm sorry for my sins, Lord. I have offended you. You've got to acknowledge it. You know, Lord, I'm a sinner. I have sinned. It takes a little humility. And then you confess the sins to the priest. Contrition. Sorrow and a firm purpose of amendment. Okay. Confession. Well, we have to confess. Now, that confession has to be integral. Now, this is very important. When you confess your sins, you make an examination of conscience. You invoke the Holy Spirit, you pray, and you examine your conscience. Maybe you go through the, the Ten Commandments, perhaps. You see where you've gotten out of line, where you've broken your relationship with the Lord. The Holy Spirit will help you, and he brings to consciousness the sins. So you go to confession, and then you begin to confess the sins as best you're able uh, in kind and number, the most serious ones first. If it comes to consciousness, all right, let's say you remember certain sins. You're, you're, you confess them. You're honest. You're sincere. You're sorry. You have a firm purpose of amendment. You have to confess everything. Now, let me tell you what happens. Very often, people are embarrassed by some sin, and they don't want to confess it. Well, because it's embarrassing. You know, nobody likes to do that. And the ones, they're very often sexual sins. And so we leave them out. We confess everything that we can more or less comfortably get out. But, oh, I can't tell that. <laughs> yeah, you know how that goes? Well, I'm sympathetic to that. But I'll tell you something. It's a matter of the greatest importance. You have to do it. Otherwise, if you withhold any single serious sin, if you're conscious of it. Now, God expects from us what's possible not what's impossible. If it doesn't come to consciousness, uh, you're not responsible and it'll be, be forgiven anyway, as long as you make an integral confession. All right, so the integral confession is confessing all of your serious sins. Uh, this, 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 I did this three times, and if you can remember the number, especially those that you don't want to, those tough ones. Now you know what they are as well as I do. If this were a parish mission, I'd go into them in some detail. And you know what? I'd be in the confessional for a long time. <laughs> Every place I've ever been, that's happened. Why? I want you to be free. That's the mind of Christ. That you be liberated, not be weighed down, and don't be embarrassed. God already knows those sins. He wants you to confess them for your own good. You know, even from a psychological point of view, it's good to get that off your mind. And so make an integral confession. That's, and it's invalid if you don't. 
let's say you go to confession, you make a, con a good confession, but you have some sin, uh, you watch pornography, or adultery, or masturbation, or whatever, and you, you're too embarrassed to confess it. What happens to the rest of the confession? Nothing happens. No absolution. Invalid confession. Why? Because it is not an integral confession. Don't hold out on the good Lord. Even if the priest gives you absolution, you don't receive it unless your confession is integral. That means all the sins that come to mind, the serious sins, you've got to confess them, even if it's embarrassing. Don't worry. God knows it all, and the priest has heard it all, and he's not going to, he's not going to chastise you. God help him if he would do that. We, we have to demonstrate the mercy and love of God. I don't care if you... I don't, it doesn't make any difference what sin. Bring it to the Lord, and he'll forgive it, and you'll be free. So make an integral confession necessary for a valid administration of the sacrament. And then you do satisfaction, the penance that the priest gives you. The other side of it is the priest's absolution. Uh, the priest raises his hand over the penitent, or the rite calls for the laying on of hand, if, if possible. That always uh, involves, that means the Holy Spirit. That's an invocation of the Holy Spirit in the, uh, we could say, in the sign language of the church, the extension of a hand when you pray over someone, that is the invocation of the Holy Spirit. That's what that sign is about. And the priest then says the words of absolution. In the Roman rite, which most of us are part of the Latin rite or Roman rite, God the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent forth or poured forth the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God grant you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins. And then he makes the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the form of the sacrament. The matter of the sacrament, or if you want to get theologically correct, probably the quasi-matter of the sacrament, is are the acts of the penitent. Contrition, which includes the firm purpose of amendment, confession, integral confession of the sins to the priest, and then satisfaction, you do the penance that the priest gives you, then the absolution imparted by the priest. Contrition. Well, contrition, the church teaches us, is sorrow of the soul and detestation for the sin committed, together with the resolution not to sin again. There are two kinds of contrition, perfect and imperfect. Perfect contrition arises from our love of God. We're sorry we sin because of the motive of love of God. That's perfect contrition. Imperfect contrition is we confess our sins more out of a sense of the consideration of sin's ugliness or the fear of eternal damnation and the other penalties which threaten the sinner. Now, that's not perfect contrition, but it suffices. It's not bad. It's sure better than nothing. It is contrition, and it's all that a lot of people can muster. They don't have a sense of God to the point where they can love him for his own sake and be sorry for their sins because they've offended a God who's so loving and so good. And so it's all right. You have to start someplace. And so imperfect contrition suffices in the sacrament. As long as you're, you, you can, you're sorry for your sins, I don't want the punishment that goes with it. I don't want hell. Lord, save me. That's better than nothing. That's not where we should end up. That's where we should start. We should move towards perfect contrition. The reception of the sacrament ought to be prepared for by a good examination of conscience made in the light of the Word of God. Uh, I highly recommend to make a good confession for many people some kind of a, a form that you can follow. There are some little booklets that have been uh, published on examination of conscience. I know that um, Leaflet Missile Company publishes one by um, 
uh, Father Richard Rago, I think is, is his name, Father Rago, yes. He wrote a very fine book on examination of conscience, a little booklet. It just helps you uh, by going through the commandments and precepts of the church. It just helps you to examine your conscience. It, you might use something like that for a while until you get in the habit of making a really good examination of conscience. One of the things that needs to be mentioned uh, is the sacrament of penance or reconciliation with reference to the Eucharist. Frequent communion is to be promoted. Frequent communion is to be encouraged. Uh, I would wish, and I'm sure the Holy Father and the bishops would wish that to the extent possible, all Catholics would assist at the Eucharist every day and receive our Lord every day in communion if it were possible. We have to work and do things that's not possible sometimes, but I'm sure that we would desire that. That's the mind of the church. Frequent communion, by all means, we're to encourage that. But there's a side to it that we, we have to also mention concerning the sacrament of penance. There's a phenomenon that's taken place in recent years uh, in very long lines for communion, which is good. Wonderful, great. I hope everybody goes to communion all the time. But very short lines to confession. Now, you have to examine that in the light of what's going on and say, what is that saying? Is it saying uh, we, like, we love the Eucharist more? I, I hope so. Or is it saying we, we're sinning less because we're not going to confession? Um, <clears throat> I don't know about that. But I know this, I've heard confessions in, you know, the regular times in parishes all over the, the country, and very often, not many people go. When I hear confessions after a parish mission, when I've preached for a few days, the lines are long because I exhort people and I try to help them to understand why it's good and what sin is and why we need to go to confession. And then they go. But Quite often they don't go unless you do exhort them first. And so this is a potential problem. I do not go by Gallup polls or such things, but they have a certain amount of worth at times. Supposedly, over 60% of Catholic women of childbearing age take some kind of artificial contraceptive or use some kind of artificial contraceptive. And they're not confessing it because they don't think it's a sin because sometimes they've been told it's not a sin but it is it is it's intrinsically evil and we all go to confession many other sins aren't confessed people say oh that's just natural human behavior masturbation it's a grave moral disorder objectively taken it's serious matter if there's knowledge and full consent of the will, you have a mortal sin then, subjectively imputed. And often it's not confessed. Well, if you know it, do it anyway and don't confess it, those serious sins, you run the risk of, ha of, of receiving communion in a state of mortal sin, that's sacrilege. And that in itself is a horrible sin. Now, without in any way trying to diminish the numbers of people going to the Eucharist, receiving communion, we want that. But we have to convey also the need to approach the sacrament of the Eucharist only in a state of sanctifying grace. And that means if you have serious sins on your soul, just go to confession, be free. Be free with the glorious freedom of the children of God. Be humble enough to go before the good Lord who's mercy itself and say, Lord, I am a sinner, I'm weak, I've fallen. I come before your mercy. Help me. God will surely, instantly give you his mercy through the sacrament of penance. It's beautiful, wonderful. It's a great gift from God to his people. So don't be afraid to do that. And by all means, do it. And don't go to communion. Mortal sin. I remember once, I, once only in my life, I had to deny communion to a relative because I knew how he was living. And it was at a 
a wedding or a funeral, and um, I hated to do it. I, we don't, we, that's the last thing in the world a priest ever wants to do, ever. Terrible thing. But what would I do? I knew for sure, and it was a public scandal. The whole community knew that he was living in sin, and so I couldn't give him the Eucharist. Now, I had to make that judgment. You know, most Eucharistic ministers can't necessarily make that judgment. That's the pastor's business. But what I'm saying is, the whole point, be in a state of grace when you approach the beautiful sacrament of the Eucharist. Now, the minister of this sacrament, minister of the sacrament is the priest or a bishop. No one else can grant valid absolution other than a bishop or a priest. It is Christ the high priest who forgives sins through his ministerial priest. That's the only one. Now, priests must encourage the faithful to come to the sacrament of penance or reconciliation, and they must make themselves available to celebrate this sacrament each time Christians reasonably ask for it. The second greatest thing I do in my life as a priest, the first greatest thing I do is celebrate the Eucharist, Holy Mount. The second greatest thing I do or ever could do is absolve from sin. It's a great privilege to be a minister of mercy. Our, our priests must love this, but I'm going to tell you something that you couldn't know because most of you here aren't priests. It's something I learned only after I became a priest. Hearing confessions, although a tremendous blessing, can be brutally hard. Brutally hard. And only a priest who's done it can understand what I mean by that. That's why a lot of times uh, priests are a little bit uh, disinclined to do it. Well, we shouldn't be disinclined. It's a great privilege, a blessing, a necessity. It says right here that priests have to make themselves available, should encourage it. Take it from someone who's heard confessions as much as 18 hours in a single day. It can be a brutal thing for the priest to do. Hard. Hard. I felt like I was being crushed at times by a mountain of iniquity coming down upon me. I've done it in the cold of the winter, in the heat of the summer. I did it once in San Antonio, Texas, over 100 degrees, tremendous humidity in a little room, hour after hour after hour after hour. I couldn't see after a few hours. I had such a horrible headache in uh, the people, the pain that they had. But I'll tell you something, it's a day I treasure. One of the greatest days of my life was that day when the people of God, led by the Holy Spirit, came one after the other and laid their burdens at the feet of Christ. I don't know how many times I raised my hand that day in absolution, but I give thanks for every one. Confession is a great gift. We are to esteem it highly, whether priest or member of the laity, we are to esteem confession very highly, for it is nothing short of the mercy of God. Now, the confessor, the catechism teaches, <laughs> the catechism teaches us about the confessor, some of the gifts he should have, the dispositions. We know that the the confessor is not the master of God's mercy. He's the servant of God's mercy. So the priest always approaches the sacrament of confession as a servant. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. The priest should have a proven knowledge of Christian behavior, experience of human affairs, respect and sensitivity toward the one who has fallen. He must love the truth. He must be faithful to the magisterium. Now, my dear friends, let me just make a note at this point in time. I have a great love for sinners. 
I was among the worst of them, probably still am. But one thing I learned, I have compassion for sinners. I know what it is to be in the bondage of sin. I have great love, I have great compassion, but I'll tell you something. I would never think of confirming a person in their sins. I would never think of telling someone, oh, it's okay, and let them get away with it. I have had people come into my confessional so adamant in their sins that they threw themselves down on the floor, kicking and screaming, literally. When I told them, no, I can't give you absolution until you tell me you're not taking the birth control pill anymore. Screaming, yelling, kicking, my husband will divorce me. Do you want divorce? Is that what you want? No, it isn't. But your marriage is already dead. Shall we shovel dirt on it? Or would you like to revive it in Christ? Screaming, yelling, tantrum. You know, by the grace of God, I've never lost one out of hundreds and hundreds like that. Why? Because I gave in and said, well, if your conscience allows you to do that, go ahead. Never. What conscience? A malformed conscience, a dead conscience, or a living one? Form your conscience to truth and be free. And so you tell the truth and you set them free. And they go in dead and they come out alive. Confession is a miracle. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. A confessor must love the truth, and he doesn't make it up. He accepts it. Where does he get it from? He gets it from the church. Where did the church get it from? From Jesus Christ. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ. And so in loving the truth, we profess it boldly, bravely. We don't back off. We're not afraid of what people think of us. We stand fast. And what happens? In that strength, the people of God are strengthened. And the chains fall off, and the captives are set free. And all the angels in heaven rejoice over repentant sinners who enter the truth and are set free.